Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining me here in the implementation track. I'm really excited to have the opportunity over the next 50 minutes to talk to you about Visalta. And I think what you're going to find out in this lecture, we're going to cover a variety of different things. We're going to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of this particular medication. We do have about three cases at the end, which I'm excited to present. I think when we think about glaucoma, really where we learn together is when we get into case presentations and, and really the last three cases are, are worth sticking around for. So please hang in there with me as we kind of get through the, the data, which is obviously important as well. We want to understand the data around any medication we prescribe for glaucoma. If we don't believe in the data and we don't understand the data, it's hard to prescribe the medication. And so we'll get into some phase three clinical trials. We'll look at a phase two clinical trial. And then again, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, where should we utilize this? What type of patient types can we utilize this particular medication? And as you see with the title here, it's a dual mechanism prostaglandin analog. And many of us are very comfortable with prostaglandins, but this one has some unique properties to it. And we're going to talk about the efficacy and then also the tolerability, because you've heard me say this before. I've said it, you know, when I've asked some questions in the clinical track, you'll hear a lecture later talking about ocular surface disease and, and glaucoma medications that, you know, tolerability is so important. We want to choose medications that our patients could tolerate. Otherwise, they're going to be coming into our clinics upset. They're going to be coming into our clinics with red eyes, irritated eyes. They're going to be calling our technicians, and it just creates bottlenecks in our practices. And so that tolerability piece is so important as well. This is a promotional uh, lecture, and so I am being compensated by Bausch & Lam for that. I think you'll still find out that we're going to learn a lot together, especially when we get to that case point. There is no CME or CE credit for this particular lecture. And I do have to stay within the guidelines. I would also encourage you to drop some messages into the chat box or any comments or questions. I do have that up in front of me here, and I'm trying to watch that as much as possible. So please put that in there. and I'll try to answer those uh, as often as I can as we kind of get through this. So when you look at the indication for Visalta, you know, it targets both the trabecular meshwork as well as the uveal scleral pathway. We'll touch on that here in a little bit but also it reduces intraocular pressure for patients in open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. There's one word here missing that we see with a lot of package inserts when we look at a variety of different glaucoma medications. And that word that's missing is elevated intraocular pressure. The indication for Visalta is unique because it's, medic, it's, it's, it's supposed to be utilized to reduce IOP, not elevated IOP, but really any IOP. And many of us know that a lot of our patients with glaucoma have lower baseline pressures, they may be more of a normal tensive situation where their pressure never really is elevated, but we know they have glaucoma because they have a visual field defect. They have a retinal nerve fiber layer defect, a ganglion cell defect, whatever it may be. And we need to reduce that intraocular pressure. And you're going to see when we get into the cases and we look at some of the clinical trials on Visalta, that this indication really fits this medication. It's not just for patients with elevated intraocular pressure. Yes, we can use it in those situations, but it's for patients with even just normal intraocular pressure, and we're looking to reduce IOP as well. When we look at the different physiological functions of nitric oxide, and what you're going to see here in a little bit is the uniqueness of Visalta is it does have the traditional latanoprost acid, which we're very comfortable with. That's the uveal scleral pathway, the way it lowers pressure there. The uniqueness of it is this nitric oxide component. And nitric oxide is not something that's really new. It's been around for a long time. There's a lot of physiological functions in the body where it works at. Yes, it works in the eye, and we'll touch on that here in a second, but it also works on the cardiovascular system, it creates permeability, allows more or easier blood flow, it acts on the skeletal muscles, it has a dilating effect in that. It acts on the nervous system, the endocrine system. If you look up research on, for example, endurance athletes, something that I'm passionate about, I'm a runner, you'll read about nitric oxide and its usefulness in, in endurance athletes and, and allowing more blood flow. So it regulates in a lot of different ways, the respiratory system. And so nitric oxide, again, not something new, newer in the eye, Visalta released about four years ago or so, but not something new that's been looked at. This is the way that the molecule looks. On the left side there, you have the latanoprost acid, which we're very comfortable with. That's the prostaglandin analog portion that's acting on the uveal scleral pathway. And on the right side, you have that nitric oxide component that targets the trabecular meshwork. So once Visalta hits the tear film, it's cleaved into those two different molecules, the latanoprost acid component and that butanedienol mononitrate portion of it with the nitric oxide attack attached to it. And so you're getting that dual mechanism of action again, that uveal scleral pathway 
as well as that trabecular meshwork pathway. We know that nitric oxide is endogenous in all of our eyes. This has been studied in a variety of different ways. You can see it cited on the bottom here on this particular slide. It's been looked at in healthy eyes. It's been looked at in glaucomatous eyes, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. And nitric oxide helps to act on the trabecular meshwork, the permeability of the trabecular meshwork, the way that it relaxes, the way that it contracts. And so logically, you would think it's great to have a medication now that can act on the trabecular meshwork to help to lower interocular pressure in that regard. I think this is an important study, even though the end, when we look at this is low, you have a control group of 15, you have an open angle glaucoma group that's 11, but you could see the percentage of reduction in nitric oxide in the group that has glaucoma, almost a 40% reduction in nitric oxide, the metabolite in that group with opening of glaucoma versus the control group. So based on this study, and there's other studies as well, we know that eyes that have glaucoma are deficient in nitric oxide, which is going to affect the way that aqueous is going to flow through the trabecular meshwork. Again, logically, it makes sense to now have a medication that has that nitric oxide component attached to it that can act on the trabecular meshwork, act on our patients that have a deficiency in nitric oxide, and can act more so on that trabecular meshwork piece of things. So how does it work? It really works in a couple different ways when we think about nitric oxide. It acts on rho kinase. Rho kinase, of course, we've heard a lot about rho kinase. It's an enzyme that causes contraction at the level of the trabecular meshwork. If we can inhibit rho kinase, we'll be able to dilate or affect the way the trabecular meshwork permeability works. And then it also acts on calcium signaling. So it inhibits calcium signaling, which allows the trabecular meshwork to dilate or open up. It also inhibits rokinase, so again, allows permeability. And that's really what nitric oxide is doing. Don't forget about the latanoprost acid component of this acting on the uveal scleral pathway. So again, attacking this in a couple different ways. This is really just a review slide of what we've really talked about, the uveal scleral pathway with the, with the latanoprost acid, the nitric oxide component inhibiting rokinase and decreasing that calcium and signaling, that equals an increase of aqueous flow through both of those components, the conventional and unconventional pathway, which leads to a decrease in interocular pressure. So let's get into kind of the different studies. And again, I mentioned this earlier, I think it's really important to understand the data around a medication. If we're gonna utilize it, we need to believe in the data. And if we believe in the data, we're more likely to use the medication. And we're going to look at a phase three clinical trial, really two of them, Apollo and Lunar, both robust studies. You can see over 400 eyes in those particular studies. We're going to look at a phase two clinical trial called Voyager, where Visalta was actually compared against a branded prostaglandin, in this case, Visalitan. And then we're going to look at a phase three study called Jupiter, which looked at these lower baseline intraocular pressure groups which again, I think is very important because it goes to the indication of Isalta that it's utilized to reduce intraocular pressure in our glaucoma patient population, not necessarily an always elevated intraocular pressure. It can be utilized in really both of those various situations. So if we look at the phase three Apollo and lunar study, you can see I mentioned very robust studies, over 400 patients in these studies. Visalta compared against Timolol in both of these studies. In the Apollo study, it was a three-month efficacy phase and then they extended it nine months to look at safety. If you look at the lunar study, a three month efficacy phase, and then they extended it three months again to look at safety. When you look at the data on this, you can see about a 9.1 or up to a 9.1 millimeter of mercury P reduction from baseline. Baseline in these particular patients was around 26 in both groups. You could see the Timolol group getting a nice reduction as well, but by Zalta, definitely outperforming and statistically significantly outperforming Timolol in the Apollo and lunar study at month three. If we look at some post hoc responder analysis, I think this is really important because when we think about what do we want from a prostaglandin, what kind of IOP lowering do we want? In my world, I say, if I'm going to prescribe a prostaglandin to a first line glaucoma patient, I want to see around a 30% reduction. You can see the AAO guidelines here saying between 20% to 30% to kind of reduce visual field progression. We know from the early manifest glaucoma trial that if we can get a 25% reduction in intraocular pressure, we will see a decrease or at least a, a slowdown of visual field progression in our glaucoma patients. 
But I think most of us that have prescribed prostaglandins over the years would say, boy, I would expect to get around a 30% reduction. And so what I like to see here is you see almost 80% of patients got at least a 30% reduction in intraocular pressure from those baseline pressures that we just mentioned in the last slide. If you're looking for more IOP reduction, maybe a patient that comes into your clinic that has more advanced glaucoma, where we want even more than a 30% reduction, you can see around 60% got a 35% reduction. And then over a third of the patients got a 40% reduction. You think of the early manifest glaucoma trial, you have an early glaucoma patient, maybe someone that you just diagnosed with glaucoma, they have preparametric glaucoma or mild glaucoma. 90% of the patients in the Apollo and Lunar study got a greater than or equal to 25% reduction in IOP, really fitting with that early manifest glaucoma trial. So a very efficacious medication, and again, only dosed once a day, falls into that prostaglandin analog class with kind of a unique mechanism of action, as I've mentioned multiple times, with the uveal scleral pathway with latanoprost acid, and then also that trabecular meshwork pathway with the nitric oxide component. I mentioned tolerability earlier, and I think it's very important when we choose medications, we want it to be very well tolerated. We want our, med our, our patients to say, boy, I don't mind taking this medication. If they don't take it correctly, or they're struggling with tolerability issues, they probably will stop taking it. And we look at studies around this that have shown that patients that have side effects progress much more rapidly on their visual field than patients that don't have side effects. Now, glaucoma is a progressive disease. So even patients that don't have side effects do progress a bit, but there's no arguing that if they have side effects, they're not going to be as compliant with their medications. And again, that's not coming from me. That's coming from published data that's out on the market right now. When you look at the tolerability of Bisalta, again, looking at the phase three clinical trials, Apollo and Lunar, you can see only about a 6% hyperemia rate with 811 patients. You look at some of the other side effects here, or other adverse events that we would think about, some eye irritation, eye pain, ocular hyperemia, installation pain, all below 5%, very well tolerated. And we know when we compare that against Timolol, Timolol always has been a very well tolerated medication. It kind of stands up against it. The discontinuation rate in these phase three clinical trials less than 1%. And I would say from my experience clinically utilizing Visalta, that this really is the case. It's very rare that you're going to get a callback from a patient that says, boy, I'm not tolerating this medication. Will you? You will, of course, any medication that's going to occur, but it's not common. And it's nice for your staff because you don't get a lot of callbacks. It's nice for you as the doctor. And when you do that follow-up at one month or six weeks for their IOP check, very rarely, again, will patients complain about the tolerability. So I think a very important slide when we think about Bisalta, not only is it very efficacious, but you're not gonna run into a lot of tolerability issues as well with it. Important safety information. This really goes to the class of the medication. This really goes to the prostaglandin analogs in general. We know that with prostaglandins, we will see some changes of pigmentation. We can see some periorbital tissue changes around the eyelid. So we wanna be aware of that. We know that the eyelashes can change as well. All common things we see with prostaglandin analogs. We want to use caution in patients that have active inflammation, whether it be a uveitis, whether that be an iritis. And then if a patient has any type of active macular edema or history of cystoid macular edema or a complicated cataract surgery, we want to be careful with prostaglandins and maybe not utilize those. This goes without saying, really, if there's an active infection occurring, we want to avoid it. We want to recommend or comment to our patients to be careful when they're using the medication, not to rub it across the cornea to cause a defect on the epithelium, anything along those lines. And then this shouldn't be utilized with contact lenses. Prior to administration of Isolta, we want to remove the contact lens, and then you're able to place this at another time. And we really already talked about the ocular adverse events. Isolta should be dosed at night. And again, it's only one time a day, but do it at night before bed, because we know that prostaglandin analogs work better if we utilize them in that way. Comment or question just came up, you know, how does hyperemia compare against some of the other branded medications? No, there's nothing head to head that I could say, boy, this is how Visalta looked against other branded medications. What I will tell you, if you look at, you know, other branded medications, the hyperemia rates are definitely in that 20 to 30% range. And that's going off of clinical trials that they have particularly done. And again, I can't make a head to head comparison with the two because we don't necessarily have that. But I will say that the hyperemia rate, when you look at the phase three clinical trials on Visalta being you know, right around that 6% is very unprecedented. It's very low. Uh, we haven't really seen that 
with other types of medications. Again, not a head-to-head -head comparison, but we can look at different clinical trials at different types of prostaglandins. And I would tell you that Vizaltas is extremely low from a tolerability standpoint with conjunctival hyperemia. So thanks for that question. I really love this study because it's looking at Visalta versus another prostaglandin. And we know for FDA approval that any medication is going to be compared in the phase three clinical trials, at least against Timolol. And that's really not going to change. But when you look at this particular study, they looked at Visalta, which is 0.024%, highlighted in the blue there, versus branded Zalatan, which is 0.005%. And in this particular study, each group had about 80 patients in it. They looked at it out to a year and we compared the data on the two. When you look at the percent reduction in IOP from baseline, Visalta got about a nine millimeter of mercury reduction, about a 34% reduction in IOP, again, falling into line with what we'd expect from a prostaglandin. When you look at the branded Zalatan, did very, very well, you know, around a 30% reduction. And so not sitting here and saying, boy, Zalatan doesn't good, do a good job of lowering intraocular pressure. It does, you can just see that Visalta really outperformed it. The question next would be, well, did it outperform it by a lot? You know, does it really matter that it outperformed it by, you know, 1.2 millimeters of mercury? You can see nine versus 7.8. And when you dig a little deeper and you look at the Voyager study, there are some percentages that really add up and do resonate with me and, and probably with a lot of you. You can see that 42% of patients actually achieved greater than or equal to two millimeters of mercury IOP lowering versus Zalatan. And in some patients, one millimeter of mercury IOP lowering matters. Two definitely matters. Three, four, and five definitely matters as well. You can see a quarter of the patients in the Voyager study got greater than or equal to three millimeters of mercury IOP lowering versus Zalatan. And again, branded Zalatan. And I keep mentioning that because when we look at branded versus generics, I would be sitting here and lying to you if I said, boy, I don't do use some generics. I think we all probably utilize generics because of the cost. But I would argue that it's important to advocate for our patients to get some branded medications in their hands. There was a study done by, uh, you know, some giants in the glaucoma world, Dr. Fechner, Dr. Um, Katz, uh, Dr. Malka Hook. And what they did is they really compared a branded medication. In this case, it was branded Zalatan versus generic Zalatan. They exposed those medications to different temperatures, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 120 degrees Fahrenheit or so. And then they analyzed the solution. And really what they were looking at was, well, what happened to the active ingredient? What happened to the, the, the um, inactive ingredient, the preservative, which would be BAK? Was there any particulate matter in these bottles? Meaning was the bottles polluted with these different temperatures? And then what they found out is that the, the um, branded medication really held up in a variety of different temperatures. You didn't see particulate matter. You didn't see the active ingredient decrease. You didn't see the BAK being damaged. And BAK gets a hard time, but it does allow medications to get to the target tissue. The generic medication, unfortunately, had particulate matter in it. So there was some pollution in the bottle. There was some effect to the active ingredient. There was some effect to the inactive or the preservatives. And so that will make it less effective. Am I again saying don't use generics? No, I'm just saying if you're not getting a response that you want from a generic medication, making a switch to a branded medication is a really good idea. And Visalta definitely fits in that, as you'll see with some of the clinical cases that we're going to go through here in a little bit. It would also make sense when you look at this data here that you may get some additional IOP lowering with a medication like Visalta because of its additional IOP lowering with these percentages that you're seeing here. The other thing that we found out in this Voyager study was that it really achieved a lot of IOP lowering less than or equal to 18. And that number is very important to me when we think of IOP because in more advanced glaucoma patients, our target pressure, which is also a very important thing to put in our charts, or at least our target range of pressure with all our glaucoma patients, when it's more advanced, should be probably less than or equal to 18. And that comes for the advanced glaucoma intervention study. And you can see that nearly 70% of the patients in the Voyager study were able to achieve that, we're only about 50% with Zalatan were able to achieve that. Speaking of another study, this one's an important one because I always think about glaucoma, low baseline pressure situations. If you ask me, boy, when do I lose sleep over managing glaucoma patients? Well, if I have a patient that I've recently diagnosed that comes in with a pressure of 29, for example, or 28, 
you know, early glaucoma. I don't use a ton. Of, I don't lose a ton of sleep over those patients. Why? Because I know we have some great tools in the toolbox to be able to lower their intraocular pressure. It doesn't really concern me typically. Now, if you tell me, boy, I have a patient that comes in that has glaucoma and their pressure is 19 or their pressure is 18 and they have a visual field defect and they have OCT thinning, retinal nerve fiber layer thinning. Those are the types of patients where I definitely lose some sleep over because I know it's a lot harder to lower a low baseline pressure, especially if they already have glaucoma. This study really resonated with me because as you're going to see here in a little bit, many of these patients had pressures below or equal to 21. These patients were followed for a year. They were put on by Zalta, 130 patients once a day. And really the IOP was looked at, and I'll show you the baseline IOP here and the control over an extended period of time. Now, keep in mind the patient population in this particular group was Japanese patients. These patients all had open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. This is looking at the patients where their average based on IOP was. So some of these patients did have pressures above 21. And the average IOP was about 19.6. And what you're seeing here is a very significant IOP reduction down to 14.4 over a one-year period. 69% okay. of these patients had an IOP less than or equal to 15 millimeters of mercury. But the study that really resonates with me is this particular one, because they really took out and eliminated any of the patients that had pressures above 21. So all the patients that you're looking at here had pressures below or equal to 21. So low baseline pressure situation. And the average of all those patients was about 18.3 millimeters of mercury. These patients were put on by Zalta and we saw a 25% reduction in IOP from baseline, holding down around 13.8. If you told me in patients that had pressures less than 21, that I could get about a 25% reduction in IOP and I could hold their pressure down around 13.8, I'm going to do that all day long. And so for me, from a personal experience standpoint, I love to utilize Visalta in these patients that not only have elevated intraocular pressure, but also patients that I know have glaucoma or I need to treat them because of their risk factors, whatever it may be, in a lower baseline pressure situation. It really comes from looking at the Jupiter study. And I think you'll find out you'll have success with that as well. So really in review, before we get to the cases, and I'm going to save, you know, the last kind of 20 minutes for case reviews is it is convenient. You know, seeing it's once a day, it comes in two different bottle types, a 2.5 milliliter, as well as a five milliliter bottle can be stored at room temperature. Once it's open, if it's not open, it should be in the fridge, but once it's open, it can be stored at room temperature as well. We talked about its kind of unique mechanism of action, nitric oxide, the latanoprost acid component. So it acts on not only the uveal scleral pathway, but also the trachea meshwork pathway. The variety of different studies that we looked at, we looked at a couple phase three clinical trials. We looked at some phase two clinical trials where it was head to head against branded prostaglandin. We looked at a low baseline pressure situation and think, think about those when we get into the cases here shortly. You look at the instance of ocular adverse events, the conjunctival hyperemia rate being very low, I think once you start utilizing it in practice, you're going to find out that you're not going to get a lot of callbacks, that conjunctival hyperemia rates are low, that it's a very well-tolerated medication. And back to that convenient dosing, it fits with our prostaglandin. It's going to be once-a-day dosing as well. Bausch & Lum does have a great access program. I would urge you to utilize this as well. With this program, if you're prescribing this for your commercial patients, you can have great coverage for it. Even with your Medicare patient population, the coverage has gotten extremely good. It was, you know, when it launched four years ago, we would all say, boy, it was hard to get. It was costly for our patients. Now with this particular access program, with just the use of Isolta being prescribed by our care providers, uh, you will find that coverage is much better. Again, utilize their access program. Uh, it will be helpful. You know, I have someone in our practice that is a champion of dealing with prior authorizations that's helped our practice a lot where they're willing to kind of do the work for patients when I want them to get a certain medication, when I want to keep them on something branded. So it may be an idea you can utilize in your practices as well. Okay. So I do want to kind of get into the cases and I was just going to check to see if there were any questions that were popping up.
And so there's really three cases. And, you know, I'll take the last 20 minutes or so to kind of go through these because I think there's a lot to learn from these cases, not only about the prescribing, but just learning about kind of how do you analyze these cases? You know, let's let's learn a little bit about glaucoma and, and learn together about it as well. So case study one, newly diagnosed patient. I think, you know, for a lot of us, this is what we run into in our practice. You know, we're in, a lot of us are optometrists. A lot of us are in the trenches dealing with newly diagnosed patients that, that walk in the door. We run the OCT, we run the visual field. We look at all the risk factors and we decide, you know, boy, this patient needs to be treated and, and how should we treat them? So here's kind of looking at the case history around this. You have a 53 year old patient, uh, female Hispanic, and the family history, the patient has high eye pressure. And so the first thing I'm going to say is that when I know a patient has a family history of glaucoma, I definitely take that into account. Uh, that is concerning to me. It's not necessarily that I'm going to treat the patient, but I'll ask a specific question. I'll say, hey, did your family member go blind from glaucoma? Because if they went blind from glaucoma, that's a higher risk situation for me than a patient that maybe didn't go blind from glaucoma. You look at the medical history, it's unremarkable. There's no other medications that are being utilized. And then the ocular history, really unremarkable in this particular situation. So here's the ocular exam component. Best corrective visual acuity, 2020 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye. You can see the pictures of the optic nerve heads here in the right and left. You can see there's some asymmetry there. That right off the bat is going to raise a red flag for me on my dilated exam. 0.65 cup disc ratio on the right eye, a 0.4 on the left eye. The intraocular pressure is elevated at 24 on the right, 25 on the left. And then we have some thin corneas as well here. Remember from the OAT study, the ocular hypertension treatment study, that if you have a corneal thickness of 555, so 555 or less, that is a risk factor for the conversion of patients to glaucoma. And so we have an elevated intraocular pressure. We have thin corneas. We have to do gonioscopy to diagnose glaucoma. Thankfully, it's open to the trabecular meshwork, 360 degrees. We have that asymmetry. And then we go ahead and look at the OCTs. When we look at the OCTs here, first of all, the retinal nerve fiber layer looks pretty healthy. The right eye has 101 micron average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. The left eye has about a 96 average retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. For this patient, I would say, boy, that falls within normal limits. You look at the deviation map over there on the left, really nothing being flagged. But ganglion cell analysis, and you've heard this really all through the eyes on glaucoma lectures. You know, Dr. Van Tassel mentioned this. So important to look and utilize ganglion cell analysis. It can be very helpful in managing our patients with early glaucoma. As a review, when we think about glaucoma at its core, what is it? Well, it's damage to the ganglion cell layers. It's atrophy to the ganglion cell layers. When we think about the RNFL around the optic nerve head, that's looking at the ganglion cell axons. That's what it's measuring. When we look at the ganglion cell layer specifically, it's looking at the body of the ganglion cells. And when we look at the inner plexiform layer, which also is being analyzed here on the right side there, that's the dendrites of the ganglion cell layer. And so in early glaucoma, I really like to look at the retinal ganglion cell complex because a majority of our retinal ganglion cells is in that macular region. So it's an ideal place to identify early glaucoma. And in this particular patient, we have a lot of risk factors, of course, but the RNFL looks normal or the RNFL around the optic nerve head. If you look at around the ganglion cell analysis, there's definitely significant damage occurring. You look at the visual field, there's nothing showing up really on the 24-2. These look like clean visual fields. This would be a patient that I very likely would get a 10-2 on because I want to make sure that I'm not missing a defect in that central 10 degrees. Remember with the 24-2, the deep, the spots that we're looking at there are six degrees apart. With the 10-2, they're only two degrees apart. So there's a very high likelihood that we could be missing a visual field defect in the central area if we're just running a 24-2 on this particular patient because of what we see with a normal RNFL, but the ganglion cell layer looking damaged here. I will a lot of times use what we call a 24-2C technology. It has a 10 additional points. It's on the Humphrey Visual Field 3. That a lot of times will avoid me having to do a 10-2. I've been very happy with that technology. But if you're running a traditional 24-2, I would definitely recommend running a 10-2 on this particular patient. So to me, this patient has glaucoma. Now it may be pre-parametric glaucoma because there's no defect on the visual field here. And if the 10-2 is clean as well, 
but there's enough risk here for me to say, boy, I'm going to treat this patient. They have a high intraocular pressure. They have a thin cornea. They have a defect in the ganglion cell complex. And those are all reasons to say a high risk situation that I'm going to manage or treat this particular patient. And so my initial diagnosis was pre-parametric glaucoma when I first saw this case. There's asymmetry between the optic nerve heads as well. And so my target IOP for a patient like this is probably less than or equal to 18. I'm not going to be overly aggressive. I want to see about a 30% reduction. They have a pressure of 24 to 25. If I can get a 30% reduction, I'm going to be thrilled with the effectiveness of the medication. Go ahead and prescribe Visalta. We talked about its effectiveness in a variety of different IOP situations. It's a great out of the gate medication once a day. And then I will assess the intraocular pressure about a month to six weeks later to make sure that I got the IOP that I wanted. You could see here, definitely got that 30% reduction, which I was shooting for, or less than or equal to 18. This patient's pressure went from 24, 25 down to about 16 to 17. And then another key thing with this case is you have to make sure that this patient isn't a rapid progressor, that we really hit our target pressure. And so this isn't a patient that I'm probably going to wait and bring back a year later or nine months later. I'm probably going to bring this patient back within four to six months to not only check their intraocular pressure, but probably to get another OCT. I likely won't do another visual field, but I'll get another OCT just to see if there's any changes to not only the ganglion cell complex, but also the RNFL, just to make sure we don't have a rapid progressor here. You can see in this particular patient, the patient was brought back about four months later. So patient case example here is an out of the gate treatment option by Zolta can be considered for that particular patient type. Case study two, lower pressure baseline situation with a patient with glaucoma. And again, I, when I talked about earlier, you know, when do I lose sleep in my patient population or patients that have glaucoma? A lot of times it's with these lower baseline pressure situations. You know, that patient we just talked about that had a pressure of 24 to 25, I'm pretty comfortable with that. I don't lose a lot of sleep over that because I know I have great tools in the toolbox to lower pressure. But these types of patients can be very, very challenging. So here you have a patient that's 69 years old, male Caucasian patient, came in, had been seen by another eye care provider, had been diagnosed with normal tension glaucoma. Prior treatment IOP was maximum about 18 to 19. So that's where the IOP max was. That would be classified as an open angle glaucoma, but more likely a low tension open angle glaucoma situation. Pressure was never above 21 at any time point. You look at the medical history here, few things that jump out at me, hypertension, atrial fibrillation. For me, if it's a low tension glaucoma type patient situation, I pay attention very closely to their blood pressure. We know that there's a connection between nocturnal hypotension or just low blood pressure in our patients with normal tension glaucoma. So this would be a patient that I would definitely ask about where does your blood pressure typically run? If they have a low blood pressure, I may touch base with their primary care provider to discuss with them, you know, their control of their hypertension. Are we possibly lowering their blood pressure too much? And is that contributing to the disease process? So I do pay attention to hypotension or their blood pressure when we're dealing with a patient with low intraocular pressure. This patient does have some mild cataracts. When we look at their fundus exams and we look at what they're seeing, their 2020 in both eyes, maybe some early cataracts, pressure at 16 and 15. Again, this is on a medication right now. We think of where their team max was 18 and 19. To me, probably not low enough, especially when we look at the visual field and we look at the OC tier in a second. Even just looking at the optic nerve heads, we know this is fairly advanced glaucoma. A 0.8 cup to disc ratio in the vertical orientation, 0.6 in the horizontal. Thin corneas again at 540 in both eyes and gonioscopies open to the trabecular meshwork with a bit of pigment in the trabecular meshwork as well. Here's the OCTs. Now we can't get tricked in this particular case saying, boy, it all falls within the green here. This patient has some early RNFL thinning, 79 average in the right eye, about 80 in the left eye. That would be considered thin, even though it falls within the green. You can see if you look at the deviation map that there is some thinning of the RNFL around the optic nerve head there. And then if we look at the ganglion cell layer, we also have thinning in that quadrant as well in both eyes. When we look at the visual field, there is some structure function matching here. And I can go back and forth here. If we look at the right eye, you have an inferior defect there. Yes, it crosses that horizontal, or excuse me, that vertical midline. 
But if we look at kind of that right eye, where's the defect at? We have some ganglion cell loss superiorly. We also have that RNFL thickness loss around the optic nerve head that's superior as well. That could fit with what we're seeing for the defect here. The left eye definitely makes me more nervous. Reason being is we have some ganglion cell loss, but we also have a central defect on the visual field. And that central defect there is concerning to me because it's close to fixation. And so this is a patient initially when I looked at this that I would say, boy, we need to have very low intraocular pressures. I probably want pressure in the low teens in this particular patient based on what I'm seeing. So I diagnosed this patient with, with open angle glaucoma, or in this particular patient, you would say they have low tension glaucoma. They definitely have a visual field defect. They have some RNFL loss. We see some GCC depression. And I mentioned my target IOP in this particular patient would be probably in the low teens. I like to set a range of target pressure. I don't necessarily like to set a specific pressure. And based on the Jupiter trial, the Jupiter study that we talked about earlier, Vizalta is a very nice option for this particular patient because we know it can work very well in those lower baseline pressure situations. The indication is for patients to lower intraocular pressure or reduce IOP. It doesn't have to be elevated necessarily. Again, I'm gonna do a one month follow-up on this particular patient. I will stop their other prostaglandin that they were on or the treatment that they were on. You look at their pressure here, 16 and 15 initially. Now we, what we see is a good IOP reduction down to 14 and 13 at a four week visit. And then this is a patient that we're going to have to watch very, very closely. And I agree with this assessment that I would bring this patient back probably in four months. I may not necessarily be getting a visual field at that point, but I'm definitely going to reassess the retinal nerve fiber layer around the optic nerve head, as well as the ganglion cell complex. I may even get another visual field on this patient because it's a new patient to me. And I want to see if those visual field defects that we saw previously are repeatable. Wouldn't stop me from adjusting therapy, but I definitely want to see if it's a repeatable visual field defect. So very likely, unlike the first case, I'm going to go ahead and get repeat visual fields on this particular patient. The last case, we'll kind of run through this. We have about eight minutes left, and then I'll let you get off to your other sessions. We also could think about Bisalta as a switch medication. So we talked about it already in two different situations. We talked about it as a out of the gate type of medication, a newly diagnosed patient, a great option there. We've talked about it in our lower baseline pressure situations, a great option there as well. And now we can think about it as really a switch medication. Well, maybe we're not getting the IOP loan we want with a traditional prostaglandin that we've utilized. In this particular case, you're gonna see with generic latanoprost. So this particular patient, 54 years old, and to me, a very young patient. I see a 54 year old with glaucoma that also makes me nervous. It's a very young patient that they have a long life ahead of them. And we know glaucoma is a marathon, not a sprint. And we really have to be aware of that. And we have to be careful with that. Patient presented for a checkup. They reported a history of OAG. They're taking a generic latanoprost. We have to know what their Tmax pressure is, or we try to track that down if it's new to you. And in this particular situation, the pressure was 25 in both eyes. You can see the medical history here and the ocular history as well, OAG, cataracts, and myopia. You look at their best corrected visual acuity, 2025 in the right eye, 2030 in the left eye. Funds exam showing just maybe some mild asymmetry around a 0.6 cup in the right eye, about a 0.55 in the left eye. And that's the vertical cup to disc ratio. The patient also has some cataracts and some SPK. So there is some irritation or some issues with the surface. Tonometry, pressure 2021 in your office. And then again, has thin corneas and open the trabecular meshwork 360 degrees. This is a case when I first looked at it that I think it's very reasonable, depending on the patient's situation, that you could consider surgical intervention because they do have very likely a visually significant cataract. You could get that cataract out into a MIGS procedure in combination and try to get them off that generic latanoprost. If it's a patient that isn't really interested in going in for surgery, they're happy with their visual quality. And I think that's a very important question to ask this patient is, are you happy with your vision? You feel like you're seeing well. I never want to rush a patient off to surgery if they tell me and they're sitting in my chair and saying, hey, I'm seeing great, love my vision, I'm able to do everything I need to do on a daily basis, then I'm gonna be thinking about another way to treat them. And in this situation, switching them 
to a branded medication like Bisalto would be an option. So I let the patient drive the bus a little bit, and this is a prime example of it in this particular case. When you look at the OCT here, you'd say, boy, it looks fairly normal, but there is some age symmetry right to left. The left eye looking fairly normal, but the right eye definitely here showing in the superior RNFL some thinning that's occurring. And so the right eye to me is the red flag. The right eye is the one that I'm most concerned about if I just look at the OCT. When we look at the visual field, the visual field definitely paints the picture of what's going on with the right eye. We have a nasal step and that's very glaucomatous in nature. It matches what we're seeing with the OCT. If we look at the left eye, it looks clean, which also matches with what we're seeing with the OCT. And I'll back up and show you that. You can see we have some RNFL thinning superiorly in the right eye. We have no thinning in the left eye. We have a clean visual field in the left eye, but the right eye there showing that kind of nasal step. So this is a patient I'm definitely concerned about. We think of where their Tmax pressure was, which is around 25. Now they're sitting at 20 to 21. We know that initial therapy, we at least want to get close to a 25% for sure, hopefully a 30% reduction. Don't always have to get that, but when we see a 25 baseline ILP, I would expect with the medications we have available to us today on the market, we should shoot for a 25 or excuse me, a 30% reduction. And we really don't have that right now in this patient, especially in a patient that's a bit higher risk in that right eye that has a repeatable visual field defect and we have structure function matching. So I would classify this patient as having open angle glaucoma in the right eye greater than left. On the left, you could make an argument that this patient doesn't have glaucoma, that they're just a very high risk glaucoma suspect. They have elevated intraocular pressure, at least they're not at target in my mind in that right eye. And we have some asymmetry. Traditionally, when I'm gonna make a switch or I'm gonna prescribe a prostaglandin, I'm gonna treat both eyes. There's enough risk in the left eye that I'm gonna treat this patient. I don't wanna have any issues with maybe some periorbital changes or if there's gonna be some hyperemia, those types of things. So there's enough risk in the left eye that I'm gonna treat both eyes. This patient's already being treated with latanoprost once a day in both eyes. I'm just gonna make a switch. I'm not gonna add anything at this point in time. I love the idea of switching off a generic latanoprost to something like Visalta, trying to not complicate this patient's life. We keep them on something once a day in both eyes. And then we'll reassess their intraocular pressure in four weeks and see how they're doing. And you can see T-max pressure being 25 in both eyes. When they were on generic latanoprost, there was a little bump, but really not at target pressure of what we would want for a patient like this, especially in the right eye with a visual field defect and some thinning of the RNFL. You can see at the four-week follow-up after that switch, a really good IOP reduction down to 17 definitely a 30% reduction from where that T max pressure was and a fairly significant drop or reduction from where they were on generic latanoprost as well. So target IOP was achieved. This is a patient again that we followed up at four weeks. And then again, I'm going to monitor this patient fairly closely, especially in that right eye, because we have a repeatable visual field defect. We have OCT thin. I'm probably going to see this patient every, you know, four to six months initially. And then as I know they're stable, I'll go ahead and stretch that out and I won't see them quite as often. So with that said, you know, we're kind of at that time. I've been kind of trying to monitor, you know, the um, chat box. I've seen a few questions that had popped up and I tried to address those as we went. You know, if there are any other questions, please feel free to drop those in there and I'll go ahead and type away. But I want to thank everyone for their time. I want to thank everyone for joining me for this particular lecture. And thanks for being a part of, of Eyes on Glaucoma. I hope you've enjoyed uh, day one. I hope you're enjoying day two. And there's a lot more to come. Thank you.